Responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 11. We'll be, read this responsively. I hope you all haven't forgotten how to do this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to the Lord. Sing praises. Tell all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and judgments God has uttered. A long train of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob. The Lord is our God, whose judgments in all the earth. The Lord is mindful of his everlasting covenant, of the Lord of commandments for a thousand generations. The covenant made with Abraham, his promise sworn to Isaac, and confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land. Thank you. Let's um, prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer, please. Gracious Heavenly God, we are grateful and thankful this morning that, that we can gather together and we can be inside. And we know and we have said for the last months and months that the church is not the building, and it isn't. But we have missed being in the building and together. So this morning, Lord, we give you honor, we give you praise, we give you glory in all things. We thank you for the opportunity that we can come and worship together, even though it's, it's not as it has been. But Lord, we are together but distanced, which is okay. Lord, we thank you for the sound of children in, in the sanctuary. We thank you for the love that, that you have bestowed on us and, and that because of that, that we can, we can bestow that on other people. And Lord, in a time when it's, it's so hard, it's hard to, it's just hard. But Lord, we put our faith in you <clears throat> We ask that you lead, guide, and direct us in the way that you would have us to go. We ask for your forgiveness when we aren't the people or the church that we should be. We ask forgiveness, Lord, when we aren't compassionate and loving and caring. We ask forgiveness, Lord, when we get so scared or stressed out or feel so put upon, Lord, that we don't look to you for the strength that we need because, Lord, we know that the lower we are, the stronger you are. The weaker we are, the stronger you are. And so, Lord, let us just cast our every burden upon you, knowing that we only see the small picture, but you see the big picture. We only know what is in front of us right now, but you know, Lord, and and you have said, and we claim that, you have said to us 
that you would not want any of your children to hurt. And so, Lord, when there are times that we can't make sense of what's going on, let us just bow and come to you. We thank you for the miracles and the mercy and the grace that you have already bestowed on us. We thank you, Lord, for, for love, for your love for us, our love for each other. We thank you for the love for, of, of Duane and Meg as they come together this afternoon and making two lives one. Lord, what a wonderful thing that nobody can take that love away from us. The world may be going to hell in a handbasket, but Lord, we can reach out and we claim the promises that you give us. So this morning we pray for our country. We pray for our community. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our family. And we pray, Lord, that you will just pour a double portion of your Holy Spirit on us. And forgive us when we get so myopic that we don't see past ourselves. This morning, Lord, I thank you for loving us enough to send your son, Jesus Christ, into the world. To live as a man, to show us how to live. And if we look at the red letters in the New Testament, we know what he said. Who died on the cross for our sins, all our sins. And for all of us, Lord, and this morning we lift up those who do not know you yet. But put them in our path. Thank you for loving us enough to make the ultimate sacrifice. And then raising from the dead on the third day so we too, when we believe, can have everlasting life. So Lord, now we give back to you the prayer you taught us to pray when we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory forever, amen. Our choir, David, <laughs> has an anthem for us this morning. <clears throat>
Y'all can clap if you want to. <laughs> Make sure that we know that you all are, are awake, alive, and moving. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from um, the book of Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses uh, 23 through 32, and Rick is going to read that for us. Without a mask. Without a mask. Good morning. You know, I feel like Terry, we missed having people out in front. I've been reading to you for a while, as you know, <laughs> and uh, I love reading the scriptures. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by that what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. You want your mask? <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, this morning, may the words that you have given me out of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Tony Campolo has a famous sermon for Good Friday, and the name of the sermon is it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. And in his dramatic sermon, he talks about the discouragement and disappointment of Good Friday. And then he ends that sermon with a pro promise of resurrection. And again and again through the whole thing, he says it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Today's text that Rick read has, has a lot of that foreshadowing. It's not a message of hope, but one of foreboding. And at every point, we need to be reminded that it's Sunday now for Jesus, but Friday's coming. Chapter 21 of Matthew's text begins with, with the wonderful events of Palm Sunday. You remember them. The crowds fill the streets of Jerusalem, and, and they cry, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and, and our Messiah run, rides through on a, on a, on a donkey, and people are putting their, their cloaks and the palm leaves in front of him. And then the chapter ends with Matthew's clear proclamation that the chief priests and the Pharisees want to arrest him. It's Sunday, but Friday's coming. And so they... The chief priests and the elders challenge 
Jesus' authority. First they ask him, by what authority do you do these things? And then they asked him, and who gave you that authority? Now, oh, I can't move. Now, I, we can only guess what things that, that they were talking about. You know, were they talking about when he, on Palm Sunday, when he rode into Jerusalem like a, a king returning from the battle? Or, or maybe they were asking him about the nerve that he had to cleanse the temple when he had his temple tantrum. <clears throat> or maybe they wanted to know by what authority he healed the lame and the blind and the sick and, and, and raised people from the dead that was reported earlier in the chapter. But the conflict between Jesus and these religious leaders is something that was not new to today. Jesus knows immediately that their question has ulterior motives. It's a word game, a trap by which the Pharisees wish to undermine the ministry of Jesus. If the, and I, I truly believe this. I believe that if the Pharisees had been asking legitimate questions, I think Jesus would have given them a straightforward answer about his authority. But since Jesus knew that they were not sincere, he turned the tables on them and asked them a difficult question. The baptism of John, where did it come from? Did it come from heaven? Or did it come from man? Now the Pharisees were trapped. And if they answered that John's message came from God, then their whole opposition to Jesus would have been called into question. If they had said that his authority, that the, the, the authority for baptism of John came from above, or came from man, then the crowds would have been against them and wanted to get them. So they, they said what they knew, which was, I don't know. We don't know. And since they were not being willing to be honest with Jesus, Jesus feels no obligation to share anything else with them. And then he tells them a parable of two sons. And this is kind of how it went. This man had two sons, and he went to the first one. And he said, son, will you go to the vineyard and work today? And the guy answered, the son answered, I will not. But later on, he changed his mind and went. And then the father went to the second son, and he said the same thing. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he didn't go. So which of the two did the will of his father? Now, I want to just point out at this point in time that neither of these responses was very good. One said no, and then on second thought, decided to go, and the other said yes, and, and then for some reason didn't enter the fields. He didn't go. So neither one of these responses had any great deal of satisfaction to the father. But given a choice, one has to say the first response was better than the last. But the natural focus is to focus on the second son, if you go down to verse 45, it says, And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke about them. And when they sought to seize him, and then they sought to seize him. It was a story about the second son that the Pharisees saw themselves. Yeah, I'll do it. But they didn't. This was the lectionary text, and I read it, and I thought, how am I going to go with this? I pulled a Mac Ricketts in my head. But I suspect, and, and finally this came to me, I suspect that if we are honest with each other, most of us identify with the second son than the first son. The second son who so graciously agrees to work but then fails 
to do what he says he was going to do reminds us of ourselves. We, too, have trouble being consistent with our words and our deeds. A lot of times we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. Have you ever made a rash promise and then failed to keep that promise? Don't raise your hands, but probably all of us have. Maybe we've made an honest attempt to do what we said we were going to do, but finding ourselves falling short because we missed the, the mark that we set so high and the standards that we set for ourselves. So I think that we can all identify with the son who said, yeah, I'll go, and then doesn't. But we get distracted. We get frustrated. We get weary of trying to do good all the time. And the next thing we know, our good intentions, all the things that we have committed ourselves to, goes down the tubes. And we end up never finishing the job or never keeping the promise that we say that we will. And we all know what it's like to say one thing and then find ourselves doing something else. We're all guilty of this. Jesus hits us just like he did the Pharisees and the religious leaders right in the head, right between the eyes. Because you all know what? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I found a story this week I want to share with you. A lot of times we're, we're like this, this dude in this story. It was a rich young man and he was sick. He was critically ill. And his condition kept worse, get worsening. And his doctor told him that he wasn't even sure if he would ever recover, but they would do the best that he could. And this young rich man was obviously scared to death. And he said to the doctor, please, doctor, please, I don't want to die. I have so much left to do in life. And if you can help me get better, if you will just get me better, I will donate $100,000 to the hospital building fund. And so the young man started improving, and he recovered. And in a few weeks, he was back at home, and Several months later, the doctor saw him at a social function, and, and after seeing that he was doing really well with no sign of, any, of the former illness that he had, the doctor reminded him of his promise. And he said, you, you remember you said if you got well that you would donate $100,000 to the building fund for the hospital, and we could really use that money right now. And the young man replied, Wow, if I said that, I must have really been sick. You know, there are people in the church like that. They never argue. They never criticize. They don't give anybody any, any problems. And yet, getting them to do anything is nearly impossible. But let's not forget that first son. After all, all the disturbing moral of this story is the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven before you. If the Pharisees and the religious leaders represented the second son in this story, then the prostitutes are represented by the first son. He's the one who rudely answered, I will not, but afterwards changed his mind and went. I find this part of the story so interesting and so disturbing at the same time. How can the prostitutes and the tax collectors enter the kingdom of heaven before the obviously religious people? Did Jesus have something against the religious leaders? And I think more importantly, we need to ask ourselves, does Jesus have that, that same things against us who are the religious people of today? The religious people always had problems with Jesus. 
They were oblivious to the true demands of being a Christian of God's righteousness. They just didn't get it. And I want to remind you this morning that Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And what was it about the tax collectors and the prostitutes that got them included into the kingdom of heaven? Because they believed the message of John. While the religious leaders were oblivious to it, they didn't get it. Jesus seemed to portray the publicans and the prostitutes as people who were keenly aware of their moral feelings and who were really eager and who really wanted to hear God's word of forgiveness and, and love and mercy and grace. But the religious people, not so much. And I wonder often if we as religious people haven't gotten to the point where we aren't so anxious to hear the word of God. We aren't so anxious and eager and want to hear God's word of righteousness and love and mercy and grace. William Barclay sum, summarizes this passage that there are two common classes of people. There are people whose profession words is much better than their practice, their deeds. And then there are those whose deeds, their practice, is far better than their profession. But Barclay goes right on to remind us that the really good person is the one where their profession of faith and their practice of faith meet and match. And that should be our goal. There's a wonderful scene near the end of the movie called My Fair Lady. If you've seen it, you probably know this. In which Liza Doolittle sings words that God must sing sometimes about us. And she sings. Words, words, words. I'm so sick of words. I get words all day through, first from him and now from you. Is that all you blighters can do? Don't talk about stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Never do I ever want to hear another word. There isn't one I haven't heard. Don't talk of love lasting through time. Make me no undying vow. Show me now. Promises can never take the place of performance. Fine words can never be a substitute for fine deeds. But let's be a people that put our words and deeds together. I would like for us this morning when we leave here to make a vow to God that not only are we going to talk the talk, but we are also going to walk the walk. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, let us not just give you lip service, but let's do what we know and let's know what we do. And Lord, touch us, heal us, strengthen us in your mercy and grace. Lead, guide, and direct us. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Michelle is going to, um, to bring us into benediction. So I would like for you to stand up. And I'm moving away from here, y'all. And go in peace.
remembering whose you are and who you serve and know that God loves you more than the sun and the stars. Cling to him and follow him in your words and your deeds. Amen and amen.